There's an old video from PAX 2008 that's been stuck in my head for over 15 years. It's Jonathan Colton performing the ending song from Portal, but with a surprise guest appearance from Felicia Day. The crowd goes nuts, and you can practically feel the excitement emanating through the glorious 480p camcorder quality. I love this video, and above all else, I think this moment is unintentionally a perfect distillation of how nerd culture presented itself around this time. By 2008, Felicia Day had officially become part of the canon of nerdiness, and often labeled the Queen of Geek due to her ties with previously established titans of nerd culture. Canons are exclusionary by design, which we'll talk about later in this video, but Felicia Day had made it past the gatekeepers and into the inner sanctum, and it's hard not to watch this footage and see it as a kind of inauguration. And this brings us to the Guild, a piece of media and web ephemera with strong ties to the 2000s nerd culture canon, but one which has largely gone unexamined. While Felicia Day and the show in general still get mentioned a great deal in subreddits and forum posts, I haven't found much writing on the Guild as a piece of media from the perspectives of screenwriting, editing, or cinematography, as well as broader media criticisms around authorship and representation. Today we're hoping to fix that with a long-form three-part look at the first season of The Guild. So here we go. All right, everyone, welcome to The Computer Lab, a show where we do medium dives on mm. games, old software, and web ephemera. And today we're looking at The Guild, a web series that aired from 2007 to 2013. Um, we're going to revisit the first season, talk about it. We're both former film students. We've both done some films in our lives. And I could not find much worthwhile or like substantial discussion of The Guild online. Mm -hmm. Even like fans of the show who were talking about it are just like, yeah, the show exists. <laughs> it was like all I could find. Oh, wow. They mentioned yeah. video games. <laughs> but like that was it. And of course, mm -hmm. the guild kind of predates what we now refer to as social media. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if Reddit was around when they started or there wasn't it wasn't what it is today. Right. Just all to say, couldn't find much interesting stuff. There's a few notable blog posts that were written about the show that we'll get into. But mm -hmm. yeah, just kind of looking at it, not necessarily to speculate on Felicia Day's personal life, yep. because I think that's a lot of what online <laughs> discussion has become. But to look at season one as an artifact of pop culture and only <laughs> season one, we're not going to discuss it in terms of where the story goes after that. We might do that in a few future episode but we're here today to talk about season one of the guild how do you feel about attempting this yeah, I just as kind of a disclaimer to the audience, I had sort of a busy week, busy weekend, but I managed to kind of blitz through the first season pretty quick. So it's it's like 45 minutes the whole cumulatively. Thing, yeah. So yeah, I kind of watched it sort of on the way over here and it's certainly an artifact in <laughs> some it's respects. It's an artifact, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm curious to see where we go with it. Yeah, and I think when we talk about web personalities like this, people come in kind of wanting to know right off the bat, are you pro this person or mm -hmm. anti this person? Person. Yeah, that question doesn't make a lot of sense. I'm pro Felicia Day. Like she's a person who exists. Yeah, <laughs> I think she represents good things in society. Yeah. But we are here to be critical of mm -hmm. a thing that she made yeah. um, in the same way that we'd be critical of The Phantom Menace or Joker Part Two or anything that's an artifact of pop culture. Mm -hmm. The Guild is, of course, a scripted. Actually, this part's very important. It's so obvious, but I need to say it. <laughs> the Guild is a scripted narrative comedy web series. A lot of YouTube now is nonfiction and like reality mm -hmm. TV and like Mr. Beast type stuff. YouTube's really not a place to share like scripted fictional content, essentially. Part of that is sort of SEO and like the titles. There's actually um, a show that Felicia Day was in around the same time that's like a parody of Legend of Zelda. I'm going to butcher the name. It was something along the lines of like The Legend of Jeff or something <laughs> like that, right? Okay. And you could see that shows were just called whatever they were called at this point, right? Mm -hmm. But the, the episodes have since been renamed to like Zelda parody gets sexual question mark, right? Because oh, like, yeah. which I, I cringe a little bit when I see that, yeah. but also YouTube has no way of sharing things that are called show episode one, because mm -hmm. that's going to show up as like a recommended thing. And people are going to be like, well, I don't want to watch episode one of this thing I've never heard of. Right. And I, I do suspect that if the guild came out today, it would not have been as shareable because mm. it's just called the guild episode one. That's not going to get like a huge amount of, I hate to say this, algorithmic traction. <laughs> yeah. Also, the Guild is perhaps best known for its music video, Do You Want to Date My Avatar? I don't know ah, if you've seen that. I have not. Hugely popular. So currently, the, that music video has 30 million views on YouTube, whereas the pilot of the show has 7 million views. Mm. And the reason that has so many views, aside from it being quite an entertaining piece of content, very topical, timely, whatever, is that it was a featured YouTube video. Do you remember this? I, I feel like I do. Yeah, there was kind of like centered artists and like certain content that they front loaded. 
Handpicked. Okay. Handpicked. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like all my favorite early YouTube creators, like, and when I say early, I mean 2008, 2009, mm. they were all handpicked by the the featured, like, Rhett and Link, people like that. Do You Want to Date My Avatar got a shout out on a Joss Whedon fan blog. Mm. And actually, we have two jars here. So as I say Joss Whedon, one's a hot take jar and one's for uncomfortable references, problematic references. Uh, okay. I'm just going to put a quarter in the, the problematic <laughs> references jar as I say Joss Whedon. And I don't mean that to be flippant, but I mean that more like if you want to know more, or you can Google Joss Whedon problematic. There's a Joss Whedon fan blog where they posted this video, Do You Want to Date My Avatar? Because at this point, Felicia Day, when they made the music video and when the guild started, Felicia Day had already been in Buffy. Kind of, we'll get back to that because there's a sort of narrative about the guild that this was outsiders making a Hollywood show. This was emergent gamer art from outside the industry. Mm. It really wasn't. Felicia Day was a working actor. She mm. had been in the industry. She was paying the bills by being in shows like procedurals, like Monk she had been in. And, okay. and I don't mean that to slay it's a mm-hmm. good thing to make a living, right? Yeah. But I think the sort of narrative about the show being very underdog and like kind of scrappy DIY, not at all. Like you look at behind the scenes production stills and there's like sea stands and flags and, yeah. and sandbags. And like the thing with those is no one on the planet Earth, I'm going to generalize, no one on planet Earth has ever bought a sea stand. <laughs> you rent them from <laughs> gear houses. Yeah. They're not even expensive. They're like a hundred bucks. You could buy them, but no one ever has, right? And so when you look at behind the scenes photos of season one, you're like, oh, this like this was Hollywood people. And and you look at the, the crew list, and a lot of these people had worked on Marvel films already. So oh, good. this isn't like a bunch of friends from Wisconsin, you know, getting a bunch <laughs> of Home Depot lights together, mm-hmm. which is really my favorite kind of movie. Oh, yeah. But this is people in Hollywood between other gigs, Felicia Day between CSI episodes. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean that to kind of challenge the way the show was talked about. Right. Do You Want to Date My Avatar got shared on a Joss Whedon blog because she was sort of part of that nerd culture canon already by the time that the show launched. And Joss Whedon himself commented on the post. I want to read part of it because the, I think it's very timely what he wrote mm. in a both good and well, in a bad way. And so Joss Whedon's post encouraging people to watch this music video opens with this video must be number one. Who is Taylor Swift? Some evil robot, probably. OK, I didn't realize this because mm. nowadays Taylor Swift is known for being probably the most famous person in the English speaking world. Yeah. And I always thought that was like kind of a recent development because mm-hmm. she was like country and then she crossed over into pop. And then right. <clears throat> she's way more famous than a singer songwriter would be. Yeah. I don't, I don't know why. I actually quite like Taylor Swift. I don't know mm. why she's as famous as she is. Mm. That baffles me. I, I, I love her work, but I think mm-hmm. it's strange. When her music video for um, You Belong With Me went on YouTube, mm-hmm. it just got way more views than people expected. Right. So at this point, Taylor Swift, even back then, was like a stand in for like the establishment famous person. Mm-hmm. And. And I think Joss Whedon's bringing it up here to be like, Taylor Swift is one of the cool people, but we're the nerds, we're the gamers, and this is our art, Yeah, which is weird. It's also mm. weirdly misogynistic to like just compare her to some other woman randomly when they're right. in the same genre. Yeah. I feel like you're, you know, extrapolating a lot, but it doesn't really, <laughs> it's like, oh, well, you know, it, it's this very loose analogy, but it all, you know, it still stems back from problems he fundamentally has and yeah. that, that are very pronounced. So it, it all tracks, I feel. Well, I think to me, this I'll read the last part because it's kind of ridiculous. So help me out. Let's go the extra mile here and destroy the Swift bot in all caps because Taylor Swift is an evil robot. Mm -hmm. Then I can get back to the business of making Dollhouse Stranger. Dig deep, people. Smooches Joss. That's uncomfortable. Um, Oh, my. But kind of, I'm not just bringing that up to, like, shit on the guy who's been very publicly canceled, right? Mm -hmm. But he's sort of positing it as there's nerd art and then there's, like, industry art. Yeah. Which doesn't make any sense. Joss Whedon's show is all aired on real cable networks. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's a weird thing to be, like, all the nerd stuff is, like, in its separate little hud. And that's where we exist. And, like, I think by this point, Big Bang Theory had already started airing. (laughs) Yeah. I'm like, this Sarah Z has an amazing video on the death of nerd culture. Mm -hmm. I I forget what the exact title will be. Put it up, but this idea that at some point nerd culture becomes mainstream. I mean, 2009, we're, we're several years into Iron Man being the biggest movie of all time. It's like mm-hmm. it's a hard sell for me for a show like this to be like, it's about gamers and gamers are oppressed. <laughs> um, you know what? I'll save this for later. I'm already derailing this too much. Let's do you want to just jump into episode one because I feel like I'm really, yeah, sure. Let's go for it. <laughs> I'm really stalling. Episode one, wake up call. Quick summary, we're introduced to Codex, a young woman struggling with her addiction to an unnamed MMORPG. In later seasons, it's officially called the game, but in Mm -hmm. this season, they just, it's clearly World of Warcraft, but they're not saying it. Mm -hmm. The writing depicts her as neurotic and overly self-aware. Her therapist has dropped her as a client, which we learn in a sequence in which she tries to have a therapy session over the phone while also participating in an online quest with her guild. I thought that was a pretty good opening, actually. Heal me. Incoming. Oh. 
I play with real people. As she talks with the fellow members of the guild, which consists of six players who are equally devoted to the game, they all slowly realize that a guild member named Zabu has not logged in for several days and they're not sure why. The episode ends with Zabu showing up in person at Codex's house unannounced after stalking her on the internet. Cut to credits. So Rance, had you seen the show before and what did you think of this episode? Yes, yeah, so um, I had heard about the guild in passing over the years and just like Felicia Day's namesake because it's all nerd adjacent culture and everything. Well, so she's like in the canon. Now. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And just having the most minimal knowledge of Felicia Day. Do you want me to go into details about how I felt about it? Well, or? let me throw something at you first. First, which is that because you're familiar with Felicia Day as mm. like a, an entity of pop culture and a very famous person, publicly very positive person. And I feel like her public persona, which is very Tony Robbins, I feel like Felicia Day is very much a beacon of positivity in nerd space. Mm -hmm. The way she tweets, it's not trying to shock you. It's very, I would say, politically correct. And I don't mm -hmm. mean that in a bad way at all. Yeah. The show is like Edge City. <laughs> like yeah, the show's yeah. an edge fest. I was watching it and it's like full of slurs and like edgy 2000s comedy. And it's so at odds with who Felicia Day is. I mean, this is like if Tony Robbins made South Park. Like, I don't even know what to compare it to. Goodness, yeah. I, I don't know if that rings true for you, but I was very surprised revisiting this. Yeah. So um, I feel like I've had like this vague conception of like, oh, yeah, like Felicia Day. She's kind of this positive figure, like a household name kind of deal within mm -hmm. like nerdy spaces. Yeah. And, and it does definitely you know shows more of its hand over time but like uh just going off like the first episode it's weird how and i feel like part of it is maybe has to do with the culture of the time i imagine like the you know zabu like showing up at her place is played as kind of a laugh it's like yes, yes. that was weird so it's like oh hey like this creepy stalker guy who's like in our guild just like showed up at my door and kind of doxing me and just like going to like my personal Personal space and everything and it's like oh hey guys I just happen to show up and then it like you know ends and the next episode it's like why aren't you like calling the police like right yeah. away and it's like yeah they're playing this off as like a bit this is supposed to be like you know this breach of like personal space is supposed to be like cutesy and yeah. amusing it's portrayed as like the most like within the framing of the fictional show yeah. it's portrayed as like he's liking her Instagram post too quickly mm -hmm. like I'm thinking like what's the most minor transgression yeah like yeah. it's portrayed like that mm -hmm. but it's it's stalking behavior right and yeah. it's it's not even the show commenting on that critically it's yeah. just like ah oh, gamers be wacky uh -huh. it was really odd i thought yeah. I, I think some of that has to be just the times absolutely and i do wonder how much of the sort of representation of gender in the show is felicia day trying to give herself the nerd credits right mm -hmm. and i think a lot of the edgy language in the show and some of the use of slurs is yeah. like her trying to say i'm a real gamer yeah and be taken seriously mm -hmm. So I, I do wonder how much of the show, especially at this point, is like what Felicia Day actually wanted to put out there mm -hmm. versus her mediating what's going to be well received by gamer culture. Right. Because if if she opens the door and Zabu's there and she suddenly starts discussing like misogyny, mm -hmm. I wonder if that would have not gone over very well with gamers and, and then that she was aware of that. Right. But anyway, yeah, the, it's like played as like the most minor transgression cutesy joke. And mm -hmm. it's like shocking. Yeah, because like not to jump too far ahead with all that, but it, it's hard to... Um put yourself back in that position like you have to kind of remind yourself rather than like be preoccupied with a certain mentality and headspace that you're already like so familiar with like you're going back to this period where these things like seemed more acceptable relative mm -hmm. quote unquote for like a lot of the first season I was like okay are they gonna like establish boundaries and like call him out on his crap and it's like no, no one does especially yeah. so it's like oh yeah <laughs> yeah and I think it's weird to revisit the internet culture a web video from this isn't that long ago like it's less than 20 years ago yeah it's different from watching like a 70s movie where maybe there's some weird language or i'm mm -hmm. thinking of you watch rocky there's a few slurs in it yeah but rocky looks like the oldest movie of all time it's mm -hmm. got film grain the colors are very clearly celluloid film yeah i'm over explaining a basic premise but mm -hmm. like the guild feels like a very modern show and then when you see the like the way they talk about gender or like some of the slurs you're like whoa like because yeah. it otherwise feels like something that could come out today mm -hmm. structurally yeah before we keep going with the summary just a few things about the format mm-hmm 
So there's no gameplay footage yeah. in the first season. There is later when they get more of a VFX budget, but mm-hmm. I think it's kind of not a show about games. Yeah. It's kind of a show about gamer identity, which I think it's done pretty well. But cards on the table, I think gamer identity sucks. <laughs> I, I, I hate the notion. Fair. It reminds me of like, I literally had a guy say to me once, just in the middle of conversation, yeah. I like music. Mm-hmm. A, a guy said that to me once as yeah. part of a sentence. And yeah. I'm like, that doesn't count as a series of words. Yeah. Like that is just, <laughs> I, th- I feel like there's some media formats that are just so common that you can't Mm -hmm. identify yourself just as being a fan like i fundamentally don't believe that there is a group called gamer like a circle that you can draw around gamers and then everyone Mm -hmm. else exists outside of it yeah i have met people who legitimately don't play video games but Mm -hmm. like if someone tells me i love harvest moon like Mm -hmm. okay we can have a conversation now Mm -hmm. if someone tells me they like video games i'm like yeah a button ha 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 like where does what is that bias you like you want the specific examples kind of so to speak or you're looking for like a particular niche right rather than maybe the trending stuff or like a generalization. I guess I just think personally, I cast a very broad net around the word gamer Mm. just because I think like there's no point in gatekeeping. Yeah. I think gaming is such a big concept in terms of how many different kinds of games come out Mm. that I'm like, we really have nothing in common. Yeah. Like someone who only plays Minesweeper and someone who like only plays FF7 over and over, they really don't have much to talk about. Mm -hmm. They're not even using the same kind of controller device. And I think both are equally gamers. If someone spends 12 hours a day playing Minesweeper, oh, power to them mm-hmm. I, I just hate gamer identity as a premise i don't know if that rings true for you but yeah that's that, my actually i'll put a coin in the hot take because that is a bit of a hot take you know <laughs> putting it in the most like broad umbrella label there we go. um personally speaking i've played video games since i was about six i was playing games a lot for a while lots of platformers and like all that stuff i guess i'd consider myself a gamer in sort of the broad sense that i play certain games and like for long periods of time but you know everyone's got like different spectrums of how much they play what kinds of games they play and yeah I feel like there's certain when you get to like these certain cultural spaces and like what kind of like media you consume eventually there's a lot of delineations for sure especially earlier into getting into anime like especially when we were young like anime was seen as like definitely a a weird like outsider thing aside from like you know even Dragon Ball Z and like like really mainstream like on kind of prime time shows um in terms of like people you're meeting on the school yeah yeah. exactly even though there's like a lot of people who were pretty into dragon ball or like Yu-Gi-Oh and those kinds of things it didn't have that kind of cultural acceptance and social acceptance i feel that nowadays there's like kind of a spectacle culture around it um stuff like that attack on titan a lot of like big anime like titles have like really broken into the mainstream and i feel like now it's more like cultural culturally acceptable there's not this like that kind of fraternizing that like everyone who's into anime felt like a kinship and Mm. because they were all like sort of outsiders and of like a certain cultural niche things have kind of like broadened and diversified so there's a bit more like layers to it now like i feel like I don't relate to as many anime fans these days as much because it's like, here's me watching like anime from like the 80s that like no one gives a shit about. And it's like, yeah, I I don't feel like we can like speak the same language kind of deal. So, yeah, yeah, there's definitely a divide and distinction there. I think so. And I I wonder how much part of that, because I I don't believe in the concept of normies. I don't think normies exist. Mm. Everyone's really obsessed with something, whether that's (laughs) birds or trains or whatever it is. I think everyone's got their thing. Mm. Like that old Ontario PSA, what's your thing? Mm. Uh, Little topical Ontario reference for all the fans. Um, When we were growing up, TV was cable, right? And mm. it's like, what's on YTV? Yeah. Television is whatever Chuck Lore show is on the moment. It's two and a half <laughs> men, right? Yeah. And when I talk to people who are into like anime and nerd stuff who mm-hmm. are maybe a bit older than us, yeah. um, you know, this cousin of mine, he he had to import Evangelion on Laserdisc yeah. because he was worried about the VHS quality or something like that. Mm-hmm. And he actually got a Laserdisc that had no subtitles. <laughs> yeah. And the reason I say I don't believe in normies is that I think a lot more people are into anime now because mm-hmm. it's so easy to watch. Yeah. And I think so much of us growing up was like, oh, Family Guy's what's on Fox tonight, so that's what we're going to watch. Yeah. And to diverge from that even a little bit is like, what the fuck are you talking about, right? <laughs> right. Oh, you know what I will say before we mm. go further in to the guild, because yeah. I think we've talked a little bit about how there's some kind of uncomfortable language in the show mm. or like slurs or edgy humor. Yeah. I think I would draw a line, and this is me. It's time for another hot take, because I'm about to just like insult every actor all at once. Oh, goodness. Did I go through all my coins? No, not yet. Okay. Ooh. Hot take time about actors making web shows. 
writers and directors who want to make web shows. I would point to, like, let's say Nirvana the Band the Show, right? Mm-hmm. Which is a web show I like a lot that turned into a, a cable show. Or even um, High Maintenance, I think, is also in a similar boat where mm-hmm. it's it's someone who wants to do something new with the medium, even at the formal level. It's trying to push television forward. And the only way they can do that is through a web show at first. Yeah, These are shows that want to evolve the format. And then on the other side of that line, I'd put actors who want to make web shows, which mm-hmm. is that they want to further their acting career. And because we live in a consumer capitalist society, you want to position yourself as someone who can slot into nowadays a Marvel movie or like an episode of CSI, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like when actors make web shows, they're kind of uncritically aping the television format just to say, here's an example of a sitcom and here's what I would be like in a sitcom. Mm. Please cast me in the new Chuck Lorre show. I know I'm shitting on Chuck Lorre a lot. Um, A lot of what I don't like about the Guild, which we'll get into in the next few episodes, is the way it sort of uncritically kind of captures gamer culture Mm -hmm. and the way it very uncritically apes the sitcom format. Mm. And sitcoms, there's actually, you know what, I'm going to pull up a quote that I really liked from an essay. We'll come back to this essay in a bit. It's someone wrote their, like, I think master's thesis on the guild. It's specifically from part of the essay where they're talking about race, which we'll get into a bit more in the next episode. Theories of genre suggest that the naturalization of racial difference through stereotyping is more likely to occur in a comedic format because generic conventions discourage viewers' critical engagement with the racial discourse. And that's the quote's mostly about race, obviously. Mm-hmm. But if we were to extrapolate that a little bit, I think there's something about comedy in the sense of people who are coming from like a performance background, they're used to like live comedy. Mm-hmm. And in live comedy, you really want to play to the back of the room. You mm-hmm. want the whole room to laugh at once. Yeah. And honestly, when you're starting out, the easiest way to do that is like edgy jokes or playing into stereotypes. Yeah. When you're doing web content as we are, you know, this is how I feel about everything. It's not necessarily true, but I can be like, oh, no one understands me. I'm gonna put my <laughs> I'm gonna put my web show out and I'm gonna be mistaken mysterious you know and we can do that because we're just recording videos and like plugging them into the computer right whereas if you tell a joke in a live setting and no one laughs you want to die yeah it sucks. You know, I can tell all the bad jokes I want on here. Bad is in like, just, it's not funny. Mm-hmm. And nothing happens to me. Yeah. It's, it's not like my skin's going to crawl. Anyway, all, all of which I mean, I think people who have a large amount of performance experience with comedy tend to play to the back of the room. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of the guild, at least with how Felicia Day's writing it, is coming from that. It's like, there has to be a joke here and everyone better fucking laugh. Yeah. So here's like the most like, scraping the bottom of the barrel or like playing to the audience's lowest intelligence. Yeah. And I don't think the audience is dumb. I just think there's a certain kind of comedy writing that's doing that. I don't know if that rings true for you, but that's how I felt. Um, with Felicia Day's approach, it seems like it was kind of kowtowing to like this certain kind of edginess and underlying thing. And it's like trying to ride this threshold of like, you don't want to be too offensive, but you want to placate this audience who is very unlikely to otherwise accept you, but you want to find like a middle ground and compromising to like a certain point or making concessions to like, okay, I got to be a little edgier than I typically want to be or should be and all that stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, because it doesn't seem, based on what Felicia Day has presented herself to be recently, she doesn't seem like an edgelord. I will say like when we talk about outdated or offensive jokes and like, you know, the use of slurs in the show, when I say things like product of its time, I do not mean that as like a way to excuse the people involved. Mm -hmm. I kind of mean the opposite. I kind Mm -hmm. of mean that we need to hold the entire media landscape accountable. Mm -hmm. I I don't think... Here's what I'll say. I don't think getting mad at individual celebrities counts mm-hmm. as activism. Right. When we talk about this stuff, especially with the guild and like offensive comedy or like mm-hmm. the way it approaches race, I don't think this is all in the service of like, fuck Felicia Day, right? Like, let's, all, let's all tweet at her yeah. every bad joke in the guild. I don't think that's constructive. Mm-hmm. What I do think is constructive is to look at the comedy landscape today, especially like with podcasts, especially comedy podcasts, and be like, it needs to do better. Mm-hmm. The whole industry, like we need to reshape what we think jokes are, I think, on some level. Yeah. I'm saying all this because I think comedy is in a bad state just in terms of like much has been made recently about like crowd work as an epidemic. I don't Mm. know if you've seen any of this discourse. I don't think so. Okay. It's, it's one too many tangents for this episode, but basically like I think stand up comedy is just increasingly playing to the back of the room in ways that I'm like, you have to at least write one joke. Mm. It's just like gotten Mm. out of control. Yeah. Anyway, that takes us a little bit off track, but let's come back to the guild. Episode Uh, two or? Yes. Episode two. Okay. Summary. 
Zabu sits down on the couch in Codex's house and seems to make himself at home. Plays this all off like it's not a big deal. Zabu insists that the two of them have been flirting online and are therefore in a relationship, much to the confusion of Codex. There's a particular disagreement about Codex's accidental use of winky faces as opposed to normal smiley emoticons. Uh, emoticons, not emojis, just for the viewers who are maybe under the age of 40. <laughs> Throughout the episode, Codex clearly wants to get rid of him, but he isn't picking up on any of her verbal or physical cues. The episode ends with Codex telling the rest of the guild that she's found Zabu, cut to credits. I will say, because we're, we're sort of doing media criticism, but also with both of us with a background in film production, yeah. I think what's going on with the sort of back and forth game, of, and I mean like game in the comedy sense mm -hmm. of Zabu and Codex just clearly not hearing each other. Mm -hmm. And she'll say, I need you to leave. And then he's like, haha, I like video games or like whatever the game yeah, is. Yeah. I think it's irresponsible writing in terms of the portrayal of race, which we'll get into in the next episode. But I think there's a, a way in which this mirrors live improv comedy in the sense that you're not necessarily going on a stage to universalize a topic or to say this character represents all people of X group. Mm -hmm. You're just there to show your individual skill as a performer and like the game of it. And with an improv game, the, the audience is playing it with you mm -hmm. in a really interesting way. Mm -hmm. And this kind of read like that. It's like this seems like a thing people might have done in a game format on a stage. And mm -hmm. then to put that on screen kind of universalizes it and makes it a series of images in mm -hmm. a way that I think reads differently. Mm -hmm. Ultimate example of this, and it's it's either a hot take or it's in the problematic <laughs> Let me put in the problematic jar. Okay. Um, Baby, it's cold outside mm. is fundamentally a party game that this husband and wife would play singing these lines. Mm. Two people trying to one up each other. Mm -hmm. um, it, it reads very uncomfortably now, obviously, yeah. which obviously gets into other conversations around consent. But yeah. the problem is when you put that on screen, you're turning it into fictional conceits, which reads differently. Anyway, so I already <laughs> have compared the guild to Baby, it's cold outside. <laughs> but uh, what did you think of this? episode yeah this one it's probably the shortest maybe um i think this one's like two minutes 40 yeah, it's, seconds it's two yeah. minutes um after the kind of reveal at the end of episode one it's like oh hey dude from our guild like showed up at my house in real life yeah it's i feel like that's a very um fitting comparison like maybe mm -hmm. it's cold outside like now that you mentioned it's immediately clear like they're speaking like two different wavelengths and it's like, like a tennis um, match there, almost. Yeah, yeah there's like a kind of tension there yeah it's it's weird because especially kind of over time too like all these all this material put broadly maybe not subject matter because I feel like that would you know to call it that would mean it would have to address something I feel like or maybe that's <laughs> maybe that's a bit scathing but it's like right it's not even the South Park thing where yeah. it's trying to do discord yeah it's not satire I feel like it's not it's no. just <laughs> it's just like this kind of uncritical like hey you have made these transgressions and it's like we're playing it out yeah it was just very strange kind of as you say Maybe it's just more of an exercise in like improv or just like having these yeah. kind of um, dialogue exchanges and kind of rhythmic banter because otherwise, and again, I don't know how much of it is my conditioning to understand the text typically as it's expected to go normally mm -hmm. versus what it actually does. But I kept expecting like, is this going to lead to some kind of dramatic inclination and tonally feel like, oh man, like he is doing something bad. Like he yeah. um, needs to be reprimanded and there, this is going to like escalate in like a dramatic fashion. And it just plays it off kind of very casually. It's like, yeah. he's around. I, you know, I'm trying to shrug him off maybe, but it's not like, yeah, it's, it's very kind of indirect and it just kind of lets things lie. It sort of, you know, enables that behavior, so to speak, or just yeah. as far as like allowing him to kind of persist in his stubborn antics of like being coercive and everything and just like not getting the memo. And it's like, where is this supposed to go dramatically? And like, it doesn't feel like it's going anywhere with that or like making any kind of observation. It's just like, hey, this this happens. And it's like, as you say, like that's, that's gamers. And it, it feels yeah. like we're supposed to like like uncritically think about it. So yeah. yeah, it's very suspicious. Well, that's the weird thing. Cause I, I think there is a, there is maybe an argument that some would make that it's like, Oh, it's just comedy. Who cares? Mm -hmm. And I think, as you've mentioned earlier, the show isn't really a satire. Mm -hmm. It's kind of taking gamer culture, in air quotes, at face value. Yeah. Um, there's this quote from the essay we'll get into more in the next episode, but the guild is significant because its claims to an authentic gamer identity illustrate how mythical norms, which we'll get into later, and assumed consumer identities permeate media cultures. 
the guild is now being super critical of like how a lot of the characters are behaving Mm -hmm. because it's trying to present itself as like this is authentic this is like the real shit so to speak Mm. and i think there are some cases oddly in the show where it does draw a line saying this is not okay yeah one of them makes sense which is the blades character Mm. he's almost like uh, the pierce hawthorne to use a community reference like blades will say something homophobic or racist or sexist or whatever Mm. and then we cut to a reaction shot of each character and cinema really works with a reaction shot that's how you do a problematic character Mm -hmm. you know pierce hawthorne says something racist yeah. cut to jeff going man that's be- like whatever yeah. it is <laughs> nursing makes me stupid you're nursing right now that's freaking hot i know right <laughs> is anyone else doing their nip set done blades that's a good way to show that a character is not being approved by the storyteller yeah. right right and that happens so that happens with the blades character when he says something offensive mm-hmm. it also happens with the vork character like when he talks about cashing his deceased father's social security yeah. checks <laughs> there's that conversation with codex where she's like isn't that illegal mm-hmm. like they really make a point of being like this behavior is not okay yeah even though it's in a comedic way right mm-hmm. and then they don't really do that with the zabu character mm-hmm. felicia day is presented as like neurotic and mm-hmm. like socially awkward yeah. so every time she's like complaining about Zabu's behavior, it's like, oh, that's Codex being awkward. Yeah. And the rest of the guild is like, oh, he's flirting with you. Ha ha. Right. To be clear, like you can portray when we, when we use the phrase problematic, a, a character can behave in a problematic way and, and should because that's what drama is, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, problems are created and that generates conflicts. Characters are behaving badly. That's what story is. Yeah. Um, but ideally, when a character is behaving in a way that we shouldn't celebrate as a society, the story can tell you, hey, maybe don't do this. Right. And mm-hmm. weirdly, the story is capable of doing that, as I said, with the blades character and with Vork, it's not really extending that judgment to the Zabu character, Mm -hmm. which, if nothing else, is just really off-putting to watch Mm -hmm. because it's so, like, I don't even know what to make of it. It's just shot and staged so straight. Yeah. Really odd. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, whether or not we think that entire story arc is well written, I would argue it's irresponsibly written. Mm. There is truth in it in the sense that like, well, I wrote here, like women are faced with a lose lose situation. If you don't load up your emails and texts with emoticons and exclamation marks and smiley faces, people think you're being rude or difficult or angry. Um, But if you speak kindly, it can be misconstrued as flirtation. Mm. And I think that's that's a bullshit situation to be in. Right. And I think being generous, that's what the story could be about. Mm -hmm. You know, let's get through the next episode. I was going to do my construction of gamer identity rant here, but. Okay. Let's just plow through one more episode before okay, I fair. before I derail us again. Fair. Episode three, the macro problem. Summary. The guild is rattled by the news that fellow member Blades, with two Zs, has been temporarily banned from their MMORPG for spamming slurs in a busy area of the game. The guild's leader, Vork, wants to discuss how they can rectify the situation. I believe that's the word he uses, rectify. But Blades logs off before they can discuss. Amidst the group's confusion, Codex seizes the opportunity to get the guild to meet up in person tomorrow, and at this point, it's also revealed that they're a local guild. I don't know if that's a real thing in World of Warcraft. Yeah. Local guilds. I don't know. Anyway, but it is revealed in the story that they're a local guild, so they all live near each other. Codex wants them to meet for the first time ever to discuss all their issues. And so she's using this sort of incident with Blades to kind of transition that into a conversation on like, hey, can I get the rest of the guild to help me get rid of Zabu, Mm -hmm. essentially. She's specifically hoping that the other guild members will talk some sense into Zabu and get him to leave her house. The episode ends with Zabu showing up half naked in Codex's bedroom and making a pun about oral sex. You like my helm? It's plus five sexterity. It's it's like dexterity, but sex. (sighs) Kind of a linguist. I did not like that ending. Mm. I don't know. I thought the hat was funny. Something (laughs) something about that ending, really. It just seems like too much of a transgression that's like played as like, oh, he's being goofy. Yeah. I will say, actually, once we're talking a lot of shit about Mm. the show, the episode opens with like a joke about suicide where she says, you can't log off from your own life. I thought that was pretty good. I think if you're going to do edgy comedy, yeah. jokes about suicide are like, there's not a specific group that's being targeted. Right. It's like edgy in a vacuum. Yeah. Um, I like jokes like that. Mm-hmm. I thought it was handled, as far as jokes in the show, that was probably one of my favorites of the season. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, what did you think of episode three? Yeah, that one kind of uh, whizzed by me, I think, because this is just prior to them like meeting up in the restaurant. Yes. Yes. It's the last episode before they do that. Yeah, there was some stuff with regards to like Blade's behavior and all that. Like Vork decides to give him like the guild's funds or just yes. like be like kind of the treasurer and have all these different assets and everything. And he just kind of like runs wild with it. And I guess he felt like excluded from the group kind of later on. So yeah, it, it's a very, very complicated ordeal. For sure. Yeah. Um, bit of an odd one, I guess. For sure. It's an odd episode. Yeah. I think, kind of to your point, like I've seen this 
uh, season a whole bunch mm-hmm. in preparation for the, the recording. There's stuff that is revealed later that it mm-hmm. kind of feels, <laughs> I don't like to do this. This is me speculating on the writing mm-hmm. process, right? I take this with a grain of salt. It feels like it was written linear. It feels mm-hmm. like Felicia Day started on page one and got to page 43. Yeah. And like along the way was like, oh, here's a good spot for a plot twist. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't feel like there are necessarily hints at that mm-hmm. sprinkled in earlier. Right. Part of this is that, and this is something I had, I had a very hard time finding uh, concrete data on, mm-hmm. but apparently at one point they get to like episode six or seven and they stop filming because they run out of money, but mm-hmm. they start releasing episodes. So at some point they take a break to raise PayPal money mm-hmm. and then finish the season. Okay. I don't have any reason to suspect that writing decisions were made after that point. Mm-hmm. Uh, it seems like they kind of filmed the script as written with some ad libs, mm-hmm. but it is possible that some stuff was added later in production to kind of raise the stakes. Yeah. Because the thing with Blades being the treasurer for the guild mm-hmm. and then he like mismanages the funds or like runs away with them. Yeah. That feels like it was added in at that point in the story because it's like, oh, fuck, we need a plot twist here. Yeah. And it's not really referenced earlier. <laughs> and I don't think it's handled super well because the season's building up to this fight with the big bad. And it feels like this conflict with Blades is sort of there to set up season two, kind of, because mm-hmm. it, it doesn't get resolved by the end of episode 10. And it kind of comes out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Like, why would Vork have given the money to Blades if he's already because it seems like the way he talks, everyone knows he's kind of a like a shithead, yeah. right? Like yeah. he's kind of like the group's Pierce Hawthorne, so to mm-hmm. speak. I know I keep coming back to community, but yeah. like he's sort of the designated offensive dumb guy in the group. And say, like, why would Vork have given him the money? Mm-hmm. Not in the sense that like all oh, characters making mistakes is a plot hole, yeah. but just like Vork seems very anal about everything he's yeah. doing. True. And it does kind of feel like an unearned plot twist, mm-hmm. if that makes any sense. That's fair. Let me let me load up some uh, I have a whole other binder or duo tank. <laughs> let me the, load up the, the rage notes. <laughs> So I've, I've spoken at length, I think, at this point about how I hate the concept of gamer identity, even beyond its its political implications, which I think it, it becomes a way to gatekeep. Mm-hmm. Like, here's who's welcome in the sort of concept of gaming. Yeah. Uh, so I'll just read from my notes here. Felicia Day has often been quoted as wanting to reshape the popular image of a gamer to be less stereotypical. Mm-hmm. And, and specifically, that's in, in terms of like gender inclusion, I think, mm-hmm. for the most part. Aside from Codex being the protagonist, I feel like the show just doubles down on the stereotypes. Um, so there's a behind the scenes video that, that Xbox Live put together for season two because mm-hmm. the guild started to be funded by Xbox Live. Right. So Felicia Day says in the sort of talking head behind the scenes, and she's just talking off the cuff, right? Yeah. The Hollywood stereotype is just sullen guys who live in his mom's basement and eat Hot Pockets. Having been in that culture for years, I know that it's a lot more diverse. I don't know if she does really move beyond the gamer stereotype. Mm. I feel like the show kind of just doubles down on like, uh, you know, Vork like making bacon on the hot skillet or whatever. Yeah. I feel like every character in the show is like a low functioning addict, so to speak, mm-hmm. which is also something I have opinions on. But oh, yeah, um, I was going to get into that as well. Video game addiction, which mm-hmm. is a frustrating concept. Right. Yeah. But whatever she wants to say about like we're opening up the idea of a gamer, it's not just people in their mom's basement. I mean, maybe none of the characters are physically in their mom's basement, but that yeah. that tone, that sort of characterization, which really i feel like our cultural like understanding of a nerd comes from like frank from the simpsons who mm-hmm. himself is doing a jerry lewis impersonation yeah. from the nutty professor yeah. and so that's why when we all do a nerd voice we're like no nah, we can find the megabytes like yeah. it's it's really just jerry lewis yeah so anyway all of which to say it's it's a tired stereotype and i feel like the show kind of just leans into it mm-hmm. with the exception of like including women and having two racialized characters yeah. it really seems like it's doubling down on the gamer stereotype i don't mm-hmm. know if you feel either way yeah more so leaning into its kind of uncritical critical elements about things assumed in the very first episode it's like oh codex is trying to reach out to her therapist and like talk about her addiction she's got like all the post-it notes and everything the hours a day uh, she wants to yeah, yeah so it's like i guess from the onset that kind of is sort of emblematic for like where the show tonally how it winds up doing things it's like okay here's an issue we can like take with like a degree of gravitas and it's like no we're gonna like just like <laughs> uncritically like go into it she just like leans into continue continuing to like do what she does yeah. but without like clearly indicting oh this is like too much like mm. the characters are all dysfunctional and you know we spend all this time with them they're not transparently for the most part like evil so to sure. say and they're not like cast in an insidious light and it feels like there's maybe like a moral bastion to kind of show off and like bounce off oh this is really bad and we should try to remedy this there's like a lot of jokes about the mom figure who's yes. like she's she's married i think and like has a husband who we don't yeah. see or we don't see like, him, yeah, yeah. And she's like raising her two children, but there's constant jokes about like her being like a 
bad parent and it's like, oh, like my children are eating like waffles and crayons or something <laughs> right, and, and chewing like, on power cables. Yeah. And it's like like negligent absentee parenting and everything. It just feels like it's funny because she's doing something like bad. Yeah. It's played lightly and where like this feels like material that should be taken like a lot more <laughs> like seriously. And mm. it, it doesn't feel like if it's just trying to go for comedy that that it's more concerning than like amusing i suppose okay i'm not sure where i sidetracked us but oh gamer gamer identity i, I swear yeah. i'll finish this and then we can all go on with our day <laughs> for um, the other episodes for the other episodes <laughs> we still have to get to as i see it gamer identity sort of relies on this like agreed canon of nerd stuff right and like when the guild comes out it was like joss whedon and marvel comics and world of warcraft and it's all this stuff that's like if you're in the canon then you're into all of it which i think is sort of where you get something like big bang theory later on and felicia day kind of puts herself out there as like part of the nerd canon and a huge part of that is that she was in Buffy the Vampire Slayer and I think she appears in Dollhouse as well question mark I'm not mm. sure about that but then like later in the show Will Wheaton shows up and mm. there's cameos from like Neil Gaiman and like all these other people yeah. a big part of nerd culture in this era is like the idea of crossover mm-hmm. like I'm gonna buy I'm just gonna name an actual t-shirt I bought I'm gonna buy a t-shirt that's the TARDIS from Doctor Who but in the style of Nyan Cat right right and I love that shirt and I love it to this day <laughs> uh, but that's sort of like what gamer identity was about like mm. let's be into everything and let's show them crossover crossing over. Yeah. And that's sort of what gamer identity trades on, which kind of brings me to this essay about a book and movie that I hate despite not having read or watched. So, you know, I'm just going to like cards on the table. I've not engaged with this piece of media. I just sort of hate it from the periphery, Mm -hmm. which is maybe not super responsible. But anyway, playing the game of literature, Ready Player One, the ludic novel and the geeky canon of white masculinity. Mm. And sort of what they get into here is, and again, I'm coming at it from like, I already hate this premise. And then after that, if you want to get into political reasons, to hate it that's also true right Mm. and so kind of the point that they're making is that ready player one as a book is sort of interactive in the sense that you're supposed to be solving the mystery along with the main character and so in ready player one everything's solved with like a nerd culture reference Mm. right off the top one of my problems with it is that it's supposed to be like oh you're cool and nerdy if you're into all this stuff some of it's just like hollywood movies yeah like one of them is that like the main character is matthew broderick from war games Uh, that is a studio movie that made millions of dollars (laughs) That's the ultimate nerd culture paradox, being like, I like Avengers. Like, oh, the billion dollar. Exactly. I'm spitting. I'm so mad. But the thing with Ready Player One that this essay is kind of getting into is that the idea of a canon is already controversial in humanities departments. The idea of like this canon of white male authors where Mm -hmm. like you have to read your your Dickens and your boy, I can't think of authors. There we go. Hemingways. Yeah. Yeah. And these are all great writers, right? They legitimately are all great writers, but it's weird when you compile a list and then suddenly it's all the same kind of person on there. It starts to raise questions, right? And I think in humanities broadly they're trying to move away from that and ready player one just throws a fucking grenade into that conversation and, yeah. and the thing they point out here that i think is kind of hilarious if you if you like look at all the authors of the works that they're listing it's the vast majority like 95 percent white men mm-hmm. what this author points out is like the best video games are made in japan mm-hmm. why isn't there like more japanese people on here like yeah. just even if you're gonna like really be gatekeepy and nerd culture it's mm-hmm. like where's miyamoto like just stuff like this where you're right. like yeah. what the fuck Anyway, huh. they refer to it as like cultural capital. The more nerd culture references you get, the right. cooler you are. And, and again, like even before we get into the identity politics of it, which I think is an important conversation, I'm like, there's no such thing as a nerd who's into everything, yeah. which is why Chuck Lore's Big Bang Theory bothers me so much. Right. I'm like, yeah. who is this mythical person who's into like comics and science and biology and whatever the fuck? Yeah. I can't even list things anymore. Mm-hmm. I was going to say, yeah, both of us come from like similar spaces with these things. You can see some through lines and certain like inner sections but yeah it's 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 such a like case by case basis that and it comes down to who the person is as an individual what their preferences are you know there's commonalities like for a while especially on tumblr to my understanding like there was kind of the mythologized group the the super who locks yeah, they, super yeah, Hulock, like yeah supernatural doctor who and um bbc sherlock, sherlock baby yeah. yeah so that was like a big deal i've known some friends who are, have been like open-minded to all sorts of these nerdage adjacent things through like various different things i feel like they probably draw the line somewhere as well but also like sometimes like i'm overwhelmed by the notion of it i was like how can you like xyz blah 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 um so yeah like that it's such an extreme rarity to have like all of that and like academically speaking i'm not a hard sciences person very much so i'm like you know i am more of like head in the clouds interested in the arts so i'm like more about just storytelling and uh the fictional and 
and that's kind of the typical like nerd assumption. Like, nerds are into hard sciences, and I'm like, I'm not that really. Yeah, we don't meet uh, up and talk about cells. Yeah, right? like, exactly. exactly. So yeah, it, it can definitely vary. So yeah, it's it's like a really weird label. Um, and yeah, to you know Chuck Lorre trying to at once like bring kind of standardize the idea of or like humanize quote yeah. unquote, uh, question mark um, nerd dumb. He humanizes nerd dumb at the yeah. sacrifice of other yeah. groups. Yeah, <laughs> I guess that's as good a place to end it as any. And part one of three. And this oh video is going to be yeah. a fucking hour long. I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> I thought this would be 15 minutes. I'm delusional. I don't know what's wrong with me. This will be interesting to get through all the others. Yeah. This will be quite a quite an edit later. We'll be back in part two to discuss episodes four through seven, along with the essay Who Gets to Be in the Guild, Race, Gender, and Intersecting Stereotypes as Mythical Norms in Gaming Culture by Cody Majur and Amanda Coate. And then in part three, we're going to talk about sort of the, the cinematography choices and the mm -hmm. staging and the sort of filmic, the, the film formalism of it all mm -hmm. in episode 10 specifically. Uh, so we'll see you then. And yeah, see you in the next episode. Maybe.